most times when I tell people that I'm from Botswana, they don't seem to know where Botswana is, if it's a country or if it even exists in Africa or like where is Botswana. And I have only one thing I want to share with you that I'm sure you'll never forget about my country. We have only 2.4 million people in the whole country and we have more cows than people in Botswana. So if you visit me, I'm going to feed you a lot of beef. Amen, somebody. <laughs> I just want to take this time to just honor the men and women who gave me this platform, Pastor Lawrence and his lovely, beautiful wife. Hallelujah. Amen. You can do better than that. That's your mama and your papa. Come on. You can do better than that. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. I, I say to one of my friends that if there's anything I learned from them, just from observing, is that humility is key in life. Amen. I've watched them for the short time that I've been able to have an opportunity to sit with them, and they're such humble and loving people. Amen. All right. So now we get to um, the word tonight. And the word is taken. Uh, before I do that, I just want to also acknowledge my friend and my sister, Nyen Adomi, in the house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. She's currently my host as I'm in Nigeria. She's been a beautiful and a wonderful host. Amen. Amen. The word is taken from the book of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 from verses 1 to 10. Are we there? Amen. And it reads, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called unto them, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. The title of my message tonight is Unfig Eve. And fig Eve. I know it may not make sense because unfig is actually not a word that exists in the Bible, but we'll get to that later. Unfig, A U N F I G, Eve in the Bible. And you know, the reason why God gave me this topic in particular. He said, I have given you an assignment to go to Grace Consulate. And we when you get there, I want you to unfig Eve. Because, you see, before, before the serpent came in the garden, Adam and Eve were naked. Adam and Eve were comfortable being naked in the presence of God. But then the serpent comes and it's very, very crafty. And it begins to deceive Adam and Eve. And all of a sudden they notice that, oh, we are naked. And they sowed fig leaves to cover themselves. So they were figged, in other words. And now God is saying, I want you to unfig Eve. That is to remove the fig leaves 
leaves from Eve, to remove the fig leaves from Adam tonight. Hallelujah, somebody. You see, before, well, you know, when you first give your life to Christ, when you first say, I do, Lord, I believe in you, when you first encounter the presence of the Holy Spirit, when you first have that radical experience that you know that only God could have done this, at that moment you are naked before God. At that moment you feel like, oh, there's nothing coming in between me and God. But then along the way, as you go about life, circumstances in life begin to happen. A lot of things begin to happen that make you realize that actually, you know what, I'm naked. And then that nakedness and intimacy that you have with God begins to be affected by fig leaves. I'm going to get to those fig leaves later. So I'm here to unfig Eve tonight that you may come before God naked, that you may come before God in intimacy, that you may not come before God figged or you may not appear before people to be naked before God. Meanwhile, you know that you are faked. Come on, somebody. So the serpent comes in the garden. Adam and Eve, they are naked. Adam and Eve are naked. They don't see anything wrong with it. Adam and Eve, all they are doing is beholding the glory and the goodness of God. But then the serpent comes and says, did God really say? Did God really say if you eat of this fruit, you will die? Did God really say? And that's what happens to us. That's what happens to us in the world. Because we are following God and we believe in God and we love God. We want to live a life that is pleasing to God. But then the enemy comes and starts saying, did God really say fornication is a sin? Did God really say that if I do this, then the wage of sin is death. Did God really say that alcohol is bad? Did God really say that if I drink, then I won't go to heaven? Did God really say, every time you get to a point in your life where you begin to say, did God really say, know that there's a presence of the enemy in your life? Because when you believe in God and you have intimacy with God, you don't doubt his word. You read his word and you believe it. You read his word and you just say, yes, Lord, I will do this. You read his word and you say, God, I want to be more like you. God, I will sacrifice myself on the altar. But then all of a sudden the enemy comes. Did God really say? But everybody seems to be doing it, God. Everybody seems to be eating the apple, Lord. Everybody seems to be eating the fruit. Did God really say? You know why? Because we live in this world. But we are not to be of this world. Yes, the world may be going left. But as a child of God who is filled with the Holy Spirit, you are to take the opposite way. You are to take the right way. You are not to follow the crowd. You are to show them that you may be going left. But it doesn't mean that you are right. Just because a hundred of you are going left, it doesn't mean that you are in the right. When you are a child of God, you have no choice but to stand alone. Come on, somebody. When you are a child of God, you are swimming against the ocean. You are swimming against the tide. When you are a true child of God, born of the Spirit, and you want to show this world the power of the Holy Ghost, you can blend in because you can't blend in and stand out at the same time. You can't blend in and stand out at the same time. If you follow the crowd, you are one of them. But if you take right, even when it's hard, when they mock you, when they laugh at you, guess what? That is when God is pleased with you. Hello, come on somebody. You see, it is the devil's duty to plant doubt in our heads. And for as long as we are in this world, we're always going to be tossed between opinions. <laughs> you're always going to hear the voice of the devil. And you're always going to hear the voice of God. If you truly read the word of God, you're going to be tossed between two opinions, sometimes even three opinions, which is your own voice, or sometimes even four opinions, which is the voice of your friends and the voice of your family. You are hearing so many voices, and you live in a society that seems not to obey God anymore. Being holy is not in fashion anymore. Saying, I will not do this is not in fashion anymore. So when you are not strong in God, you begin to put on fig leaves. <laughs> you begin to put on fig leaves. Fig leaves is when you come to church church on Sunday and you are lifting up your hands, uh, the same hands that were touching alcohol last night, uh, the same hands that were touching a girl last night, uh, the same hands that were touching a boy last night uh, and you say hallelujah glory to Jesus. Uh, you are putting on fig leaves uh, because at the moment what people see uh, is not exactly what is happening in the secret place. Uh, God sent me here tonight uh, to tell you uh, that the days of playing church are over. Now is the time for radical Christians.
Christians. Now is the time for those who say, I will stand for God. Now is the time for those who say, I will die to self. I will die to the flesh and I will stand for God. Hallelujah, somebody. Yes, hallelujah. The devil, he plants a seed in our minds. He has this tendency of making us feel like we're not really sinning. He makes sin seem inconsequential. That is to say, he makes sin look like, you know what, you can just ask God for forgiveness and then God will forgive you. He did it with Eve. He said to Eve, you will not certainly die. After God told Eve and Adam that if you eat this fruit, you will die. So the same happens with us. The devil makes us, uh, makes us look at sin like there will not be any heavy consequences. I'll still wake up in the morning. I'll still go to church on Sunday. Everything will be okay. He twists the word of God. When God says the wage of sin is death, the devil comes and says that, oh, the wage of sin is not death. The devil comes and he makes us see good in what God has called bad. The devil comes and makes you look at that fruit and begin to desire it. You know very well that God says, oh, if you sleep with a man who's not your wife, it's a sin. But all of a sudden, you look at that woman and you say, God will have to forgive me for this one. God will have to understand on this one. He makes you desire to do something that is completely opposite to what God said you should do. And then he begins to plant that seed and he tells you, you know what, for as long as you are not actually having sex, you can watch pornography. For as long as you are actually not having sex, you can masturbate debates and all these things are, are a seed of lust so when God sees you and sees a person who's fornicating and a person who's in adultery he sees the same thing he just sees lust but the devil makes it looks like oh this one is not as bad as this one we have become Christians who categorize sins we have become Christians who are so judgmental who are so hypocritical you can point out a log you can point out something small in your brother in your brother's eye in your sister's eye, but you forget to address the log in your own eye. You forget to address the gossip. You forget to address the malice and the envy and the pride in your heart, but you are easily calling out those who are living in fornication because their sin can be seen by everyone. Meanwhile, your sin is hidden and you think you are better than them, but God is a God who weighs the motives of the heart. God is a God who looks on the inner. God is a God who will say to you, you you are just as bad as her because you refuse to address your own sin. Come on, somebody. I know the message is uncomfortable, but the assignment is what God gave me. So I cannot preach a happy message because then I'll be preaching out of my own assignment, not God's assignment. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah, somebody. The devil gives us examples, you know, of so and so who are doing it. Ah, but... This one also is doing it. This one too is doing it. That one too is doing it. But they're still in the praise and worship and singing. And everybody claps when they sing. But they're still worshiping and leading prayer in church. And people are still praying along with them. So the devil makes, it, makes you compare and say, oh, you know what, it's not as bad. And you begin to follow the crowd. When God is saying, don't follow the crowd, it's called group psychology. That is why God says, do not be unequally yoked. Because the minute you start hanging out with people who make sin look like it's in fashion, sooner or later you're going to join them. There's no way you can be around people who are committing sin every day and are comfortable in it. And you say you are a true child of God. There's no way you can be comfortable around people that you know are on their way to hell and you're not saying say anything to, to help them. There's no way, you know, people like to say, but Jesus sat with the sinners. Yes, he sat with the sinners. He didn't sin with the sinners. He sat with the sinners to redeem them, to pull them into the light. But we have become Christians who sin with the sinners and justify our own behavior. Oh, we become Christians who are so hypocritical. We become I'm Christians who know how to play the word, to quote the word, to quote the scriptures on Facebook every day, but you're not living the word. You're not abiding in the word. You just know how to quote the scripture from Genesis to Revelation, and God is looking at you and saying, my child, if you do not repent, you have but a little time, because whether you believe it or you don't believe it, Jesus is coming sooner. 
Jesus is coming back soon. And he's coming back for a bride that is, blemish, that is without blemish. He's coming back for a bride that is spotless. He's coming back for those ones who were swimming against the tide when people laughed at them. He's coming up for those ones who put their life on the altar. People may say, well, because I go to, I go to church, God will understand. No, he doesn't understand why you are selling yourself so short. Come on, somebody. I'm only 29 years old. And before, before that, I was in church. You know, since I was a, a child, I was in church and I was thinking that I'm saved. I was doing what the crowd does. I got to a varsity. Guess what? Met the wrong people. Began to do what they were doing. Began to drink. It was all about the party now. It was about the boys because alcohol goes hand in hand with sexual immorality. You cannot find drunkenness and not find sexual immorality. Those two are twins. They go hand in hand. So I was one of them. I, I thought I was living the life. And the thing is, because I was a debater, because I was uh, this smart student, you know, the cream of the school, I could justify anything. I could tell you that this microphone is yellow when it's black and you believe that it's yellow. I was that kind of person who would challenge everything. And I challenged everything about the word of God I began to say no but this one doesn't make sense so I'll choose this one and believe this one and not believe this one until one day I got to South Korea that's where I've been for the past five years doing my masters and God was waiting for that chance where he would take me away from that crowd and have me in the wilderness where I'm alone and meet me there and say my child you can you, you can negotiate against what people are saying but you can't negotiate with an encounter when you you encounter Jesus. You can't negotiate with it. All of a sudden you begin, your life begins to take a turn around. You begin to take a turn around and people are like what happened to her? Why is she not the same person who was drinking with us? Why is she not the same person who is smoking with us? Why is she not the same person? Because you can't negotiate with an encounter. But many of us we've only heard the word. We haven't let the word settle on the inside of us that we may have an encounter that changes our life. We have not yet turned to God with our hearts. We've turned with our lips. We become the Pharisees of this generation. But I'm here tonight to tell you that if you are hungry in your belly and you are saying, Lord, I'm tired of this life of hypocrisy. God, I want you to meet me where you are. He met a 23-year-old girl in South Korea when nobody was there and her life was never the same again. I came to tell you today, uh, if you want to have a true encounter, the grace is available in the house. Come on, somebody. Oh, hallelujah. You see, Eve looked at the fruit long enough for her to be tempted. She looked at it, the Bible says, she saw it desirable to gain wisdom. Which means that we don't fall into sin with our eyes closed. No, 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 no. You ponder over this thing long enough. And then it begins to take a root in your heart. Before you can get to undressing and doing something with that man or that woman. You've looked at her long enough. And that is why Jesus was saying, adultery begins in the heart. Because before you get to the action, you've been looking and saying this would be desirable for, for this and that, for pleasure. So I came to tell you the mistake that Eve did. She allowed the devil. She allowed the devil to have a conversation with her and begin to convince her what God said. That friend, when you get to school who's telling you uh, that it's okay for you to sin uh, but still go to church. Uh, that is the serpent in your life. Uh, he, you, if you stay around that friend for a long time, you begin to do what that friend does. You begin to think the way they do. You begin to look at the sin long enough and then very soon you fall into it. So I'm here to tell you uh, that some, some of you, your problem is that you need to cut off some people from your life. You need to cut off that through that people from your life. Uh, those bad influences, uh, those people who makes sin look like it's in fashion. You need to cut them out of your life because God is calling you back. God is saying, come back to the place of intimacy. Come
Come back to the place uh, where you are naked before me. Come back to the place uh, where your hands are cleaner. Some of us are lifting hands on church uh, on Sunday. The same hands that are beating your wife at home. Uh, the same wife, uh, the same hands uh, that are beating your children at home. Uh, some of us are lifting our hands on Sunday. The same hands uh, that oppress the poor, that oppress the unjust. Some of us are lifting our hands on Sunday and God is not looking at your hands. God is not looking at your lips. God is looking at your heart and God is calling you back to a place. God is calling you back to a place of intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody. Only unbelievers go into sin with their eyes closed, not us. Because the Bible says, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. So they begin to see what is wrong as right. But for us believers who sit under this altar, I've sat here twice. And I can tell you the word that comes from this pulpit is, un uh, is, is unpolluted. It's very pure. Sunday I was here when the minister was talking about temptation. I could see that the word that is coming from this pulpit is unfiltered. It's the raw word. So there's no way you can be consuming the raw word of God. And then your behavior is quite opposite. There's no way you can be consuming the raw word of God. And then you say you fell into sin by mistake. No, 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 no. It's a choice. It's it's a choice for you to open your mouth and begin to gossip about your co-worker. It's a choice for you to begin to slander people. It's a choice for you. So nobody can say, oh, I fell into it. Because on that day of judgment, many will say I prophesied in your name. Many will say I was in the praise and worship. Many will say I was an usher. Many will say I was in church giving my title. Many will say I was doing this and that. And he will say, depart from me. I never I knew you are you workers of iniquity he will say depart from me I never knew you are you were praising me with your lips but your heart was far from me I came to tell somebody let your heart return back to the Lord return back to your first lover he's calling you to come naked before him he's coming be calling you back to say daddy I repent and this time I mean it come on somebody Repentance is not when we cry on Sunday. It's not when the word is hot and you are crying and emotional. Repentance is when you take a turn around. Repentance is when you say, I've been in sin long enough, now it's time for me to make a choice. We wonder why the power of God is not moving like it used to in the book of Acts. And it's because our hands are not clean. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands, he who has a pure heart, and he who is not lifted up in vanity. Ah, the church is lifted up in vanity. All the things we do is so that we can be seen, so that somebody can say you are a minister, you are a pastor, you are in the praise and worship, you are this and that. We have become like the Pharisees who love the place of honor. We become like the Pharisees who love titles, who like the Francis, the Pharisees who clean the, the outside of the cup but the inside was filthy and dirty. We have become like the Pharisees and yet we want the power of God to fall on us. No, it doesn't work that way. Cleanse yourself. Wash your hands. Turn back your heart and then you will see the fire of God fall upon you. You begin to see yourself working exploits in your life because you have emptied yourself. Because you have cleaned yourself up. I came to tell somebody You've been asking yourself, uh, why is the fire of God not working in my life? Uh, because you need to wash the inside of the cup. Uh, that bitterness, that unforgiveness, that envy, that pride, uh, all of it, uh, it needs to go. Hallelujah, somebody. And I just want to say, just because you know better, doesn't mean that you do better. Because we know better, right? Come on, answer me. We know better, right? But can we say that we do better 100% of the time? No. But you see, when knowledge is not applied, it will not work for you. Only applied knowledge becomes wisdom. When you, all you have is knowledge of the word of God, and you don't apply it, it will not work for you. You see, I'll give an example of Samson. 
I believe that he knew better than to, to entertain Delilah. But he still entertained Delilah. He saw that this woman is out to get him. He saw that this woman just wants to know his strength to destroy him. But Samson got to a place where he thought he could never be brought down. He got to a place where the confidence was no longer in God, but the confidence was in self. And so Samson did not take heed. But the Bible says, let he who stands, let he who thinks he stands, take heed lest he falls. Samson did not take heed. He began to play with fire, but not expecting to get burnt. He began to play with fire, and he played it long enough until he actually got burnt. So I'm here here to tell you, uh, Samson knew better, uh, but Samson did not know, did not do any better. He knew better. David knew better than to sleep with someone's wife, uh, but he still lasted after, after what's her name, Bathsheba, and he even made a call, go and get me that woman, and had her husband killed uh, because he was trying to cover up uh, the pregnancy that he, he induced in that woman. He knew better, but didn't know any better. Eve knew better not to eat the fruit, uh, but she still allowed the son to convince her to eat the fruit. I could go on and on, but I want you to replace Eve, replace Samson, replace any other person with your name and say, this time I knew better, but I didn't do any better. But thank God we serve a God of second chances. We serve a God who does not condemn you. We serve a God who convicts you that you may turn your life around and come back to that place where you are naked before him. We serve a God of Jonah who still gave Jonah a second chance after he was in the belly of a fish. I came to tell you, you are not condemned. The Holy Spirit is convicting you. He's reminding you, even as I speak right now, of the things that you tolerate that are not of him. And he's saying, my daughter, if only you can let this one go, I will use you in a way that people will see you and know that I have called you and anointed you and appointed you. He's saying, my son, if only you can let go of that woman, I will begin to show you the promises uh, that are upon your life uh, that are mighty and greater uh. there is no woman or man uh, who's worth your destiny there is no woman or man uh, who's worth what God has for you but some of us uh, we have traded what God has for us for what the devil has given us come on somebody hallelujah it's possible to be in church your whole life and have an ability to quote the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and even speak in tongues and pray in tongues and pray over people and they say they are healed. Meanwhile, God is not even in the picture. You know why? Because gifts and callings are without repentance. So don't measure your intimacy with the Holy Spirit based on your speaking in tongues. Come on, even the devil speaks in tongues. Don't measure your intimacy with the Holy Spirit based on your church attendance. Ah, that don't scare the devil. Don't measure your intimacy with the Holy Spirit by your tithes and your offerings. You can be the biggest giver and still be on your way to hell if you don't change your ways. Don't measure your intimacy with the Holy Spirit based on your proximity to the pastor. You can be close to the pastor and be very far from God. Don't measure your proximity with the Holy Spirit based on any other thing. But how you measure your intimacy with the Holy Spirit is with a broken and contrite spirit. When you are broken in the secret place, when no one is watching, and you are praying, you are on your knees. God, I repent. God, have mercy on me. God, I don't want to do this anymore. God, I want to please you. God, I want you to take over. When you are a mad woman at 5 a.m. and you are praying the prayer of repentance. When you are a mad woman and a man who's on fire for God, you are constantly asking God, I cannot do this without you. I need you, Lord. I need you to invade me. I need you to change me. I need you to take over. When you are broken and you are contrite before God, that is when the Holy Spirit says, this one, mark them. I will use them for my glory in a way that people will look at them and marvel. Come on, somebody. <laughs>